<laughs> and Patrick joins us this morning. Actor, author, film star. How are you? God bless you. God bless very you. nice to see you. Good honey. to see you again. How's yes. life? Things good? Yes, very good. I've become a grandfather since I saw you. You have pictures in your wallet. Yeah, they're not very good pictures. These I did, I did have someone. I think I've given them to. A, oh yes, he's <laughs> just started to. Oh, oh, I just happen to have them with me. Yes, oh, and why not? Which way? Which camera? That's me and the and the little boy. Is Christopher's name is on the beach at La Jolla oh, turn last around week. Behind me. Okay, here we go. Yes, it's right. He's a small fellow, of course. You, you got know. him on the beach. Do you have any other close-ups of him? Oh, there he is with it. Oh yes, I have. There's. Quite a good one then. Oh, here's one. Look. Here's a closer one on the beach. Wait a minute, yeah. we're not finished. Oh, yet. I'm so sorry. His name? His name is Christopher Barnaby Archibald. Is so this you've got Patrick the with him? Is this you? No, that's his mother. That's look him, a more that. closer. He's a fine little person. He's been walking for about a month. You're not thrilled or anything, are you? Oh yes, it's <laughs> it, it adds, it, It's another yes. chapter, isn't it? In it's your a whole, whole life. other chapter. You don't know anything about being a grandmother for good. Might happen sake. soon. With my oldest daughter, you never know. Yeah. Um, you have written this autobiography, and yeah. it's wonderful reading. It reads much more like fiction than an autobiography. It's quite a story. Take us back to this unbelievable childhood that you had: an well, alcoholic mother, a lesbian mother, an alcoholic and racehorse trainer father. She was a little better than lesbian, you know. I mean, les I'm not knocking lesbians, but she lived with a lesbian lady who was the heir to Dewar's whiskey and consumed a great deal of her inheritance. Um, <laughs> uh, and she also, my darling mother, visited my father, who only lived three miles away. He was the shortest racehorse trainer in Lambourne, which name is place. And then she had uh, my brother by the tallest racehorse trainer in Lambourne, whose name was Ozzie Bell. And she used to, uh, usually tagging me along in tow, and I had to wear a kilt, because we weren't allowed to wear trousers in this all-female establishment. But she took us between the hours of five in the afternoon and six, round this little route, my father, the, f the father of my brother, and then back to her lesbian lover with me. And I grew up to be completely normal. I can't understand it. Uh, we'll talk about that too, Patrick. Yeah. Uncle Edith was... Were Evelyn, you, her name was. Evelyn. Yes, Evelyn. And you and that's what you called her, Uncle Evelyn. Well, but naturally, yes, because it's... she had a great deal of authority, and she was a very distinguished woman. And uh, she had a cigarette in one hand, and a glass of whiskey in the other. And she uh, had those in her hand until she died at the age of fifty-two. Unfortunately, poor darling, from cancer of the throat. I equated her with Hitler. I absolutely loathed her. And I myself uh, managed to give up cigarettes finally because the analyst said to me, and who do you hate? I think he expected me to say my father or something. I shrieked and screamed at a primal scream and shrieked Evelyn. And of uh, course, you see, I'd obviously taken on the guilt. As I'd equated her with Hitler and she died through smoking, I <laughs> like that for you, 80 a day. I was a cigarette with a man attached to it. Anyway, when I shouted Evelyn, it exorcised it. Now, this book is, I hope, a humorous account of my mother living in the 20s and 30s. It is. Going off to school, uh, you were dabbling in some pretty heavy stuff as a youngster in school. Yeah, the thing you know, if you led a lifestyle like my mother, what do you do with a child? Yeah. And even more, two child, the second one being a mistake, of course, by Ozzy. Uh, you send them away, which was the fashion at the time, and you went away at five to a boarding school, and you came back at 17. Well, of course, what do you do between the age of five and 17? Between the age of eight and 17 is the highest point of sexuality. The good God decreed that so that we would have the population going on. Well, now, if you've got no women, the first woman I ever saw with no clothes on, I was 19, and I thought, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen in my life. And so I married her. Before that, it was just boys. Uh, nothing indecent, no sodomy, none of that sort of stuff. But obviously, we had to play. And unfortunately, there was corporal punishment. And so all of our early sexuality was based on pain. Now, uh, this is a very common syndrome. I'm not saying it's special to me, and it's certainly not fiction. But you have to grow out of those sort of things. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was to show that people, not nowadays, because everybody, of course, is so... Uh, liberated, open-minded, and nobody does anything awful. They just <laughs> snort themselves to death and still drink themselves mm, to death. But that's, that's beside funny, the point. Uh, in my day, we were brought up as terrible, deviationary perverts. It's, as I say, amazing. I've reached the age of 67. I'm an old-age pensioner. I get a pension, and I'm very happy. There's one thing, though, that you didn't avoid, and that is the hereditary aspect of alcohol. You had some pretty good drinking days. Uh, well, you know, not in you? the basis. The people you must have talked to, and I could number <laughs> on the fingers of about eight hands. No, I don't consider that I had. My father was an alcoholic, my mother was an alcoholic. On the other hand, my mother died at the age of 95 two years ago, and largely imbibed brandy. She ate very little. It didn't seem to do her any harm at all. No, I drank alcohol for a time. I wish I still did. It's a great thing to drink. 
Oh, did it ever affect your work, like on the Avengers? Oh, no, not at all, because the work was minimal. No, uh, I, I played 16 months on Broadway in Sleuth about 10 years ago. Now, that really was... Uh, I can't act on the stage anymore, but th that's really demanding. My friend Liz Robertson's just been here with Nureyev. Were you drinking during Sleuth? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all? No, I haven't had a drink now for... I haven't smoked for 20 years, and I haven't drunk for about 15. How about your third wife, Baba? Baba, she's darling. She's Hungarian. And this is the best of all, isn't it? I mean, you're very happy now, aren't you? Oh, it's wonderful. We have no recourse except to be happy. We were married two years ago by a lovely lady, the Reverend Shirley Fletcher. She was dressed from top to toe in white lace, and there was nobody else there but us. And at the end, she held us, gave us a little brochure which gave us the best methods of birth control. I mean, we're both 67 years old. My <laughs> wife, uh, Darling Baba, she said, well, she really must believe in miracles. Isn't that great? <laughs> uh, the time during the Avengers, uh, Diana Rigg, you have said that when she left the show, it changed. How was she treated uh, as a oh, female? Oh, dreadfully. Um, she was representative of that time in comic strip form. It may seem ridiculous. Now, in the early 60s, as being representative of the new feminism in, in women, and yet she was treated by male chauvinist pig-type producers. Now all the producers are women, thank goodness. They've taken it into their own hands. Uh, but at that time, she was treated extraordinarily bad. I love her dearly. She should be here. She's taken over from Vincent Price in the mystery series. So I, I talked with her last year. I really oh, I'm so like, pleased. She's you a did. lovely lady. I love her. She? Yeah, she's one of the great ladies. That show, did you ever expect when you started it that the Avengers would have such classic appeal? Not remotely. It had Johnny Dankworth, who's a great musician in the original show, as the composer. It's now over a quarter of a century since we started it, and of course I didn't expect it. If I had expected it, I would have had a better contract. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't you? Isn't that true in a way? Yeah. Patrick McNee, The Avenger Returns. Now, you have to tell me, blind in one ear, where does the title come from? It comes from that awful thing that we English have of not liking to say. Obviously, the person who was talking about a duck naturally said deaf in one ear. But uh, most people would say, you mean deaf in one ear, not me. I just <laughs> sort of you wait, you know. I didn't like to say. <laughs> That's why I was sent away. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Patrick. God bless Take you. Take care Thank of you, yourself. Patrick.